Good morning. Welcome to worship, everybody. It's so good to see you here out in the parking lot at Christ Lutheran Church. And so grateful to those of you who can join us on Facebook Live. If you're in your car right now, give me a big hello with your horn. Here you go. All right. It is so good to have you here. Just a couple of um, reminders. We continue to have our Wednesday evening uh, evening prayer at 7 p.m. That's on Facebook Live. Um, you can find other opportunities, Bible studies, and other things that are going on throughout the week um, on, the, on our homepage. Uh, but something new that we're starting this week on Thursdays from 2 to 7, the sanctuary will be open for you to have some silent prayer. Um, in order to keep um, social distancing, there is a sign-up. For that um, and so you can find that on our website um, if it hasn't already it will go out in an email and you'll get something in the mail as well um, so that you if you'd like to come in just for a time of silent prayer to be in our beautiful worship space we'll be doing that on Thursdays uh, between the hours of 2 and 7 okay woohoo all right <laughs> we continue now with the thanksgiving for baptism. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning, your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.
Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you show perpetual loving kindness to all your servants. Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God saw what people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways. God changed his mind about calamity, and that he said he would bring upon them and did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah. He became angry. He, praised, he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, this is not what I said while I was in my own country. That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you are gracious, God, and merciful. So to anger and abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take that, my life from me, for, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come over up Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But then when dawn came the next day, God pointed a worm that attacked the bush so that was the head of Jonah, so, he, so that Jonah's head was faint and asked him that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, it is right for you to be angry about the bush and said, for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into nighttime and perished at in the night and should not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city where there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the right from the left hand and many animals. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, God. Thank you, Kaya. For that. So today we have a reading from Jonah. And uh, when God saw that the people did, God was upset. But God sent Jonah for the sole purpose of what? To make things better. For them to change their ways and to improve what's going on. Children, when we are in trouble, it's good to know that we're in trouble if we've done something wrong. And if we don't know we've done something wrong, how can we 
change our ways. God wants us to, to live our life fully, fully in love and fully in joy and fully in peace. But sometimes we make mistakes, and God tries to tell us that. Sometimes he sends a prophet to say, people, turn away from your ways and go another way. Sometimes he tells us through, through our friends and neighbors who might care about us and share things for us to help us know when we need to do something in a better way. God loves us so much that he wants to correct our relationship with him and others all the time and to live fully in his grace and love and truth. So I know it's hard to hear when you've done something wrong. I don't like being told I've done something wrong. I would always avoid that as a kid. When I heard my mom say my whole name, Carl David Scola, ooh, I knew I was in trouble and I'd go hide. But God calls us by name. And he says, my child, here's the way to go. Here's the way to live fully in love and grace and truth. So it's okay for someone to tell you how to live better. Because when their voice comes from God, it's all to make things right. Thank you. Amen. reading from Matthew. Jesus said to the disciples, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and he said to them, you also go out into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The word of the Lord. So Pastor Dave was just talking about when uh, he heard his full name, he knew he was in trouble. Uh, yeah, I would get that too. If I got Cynthia Christine Kaiser, it was bad. But I also got this one. If you can see my fingers, can you see what I'm doing? Sure many of you know what this is. I can still see my mother doing it, asking the question. I can still hear exactly how her voice sounded. You know what this is? This is the world's smallest violin playing just for you. Yes, mom, if she's watching, I hope she's laughing. But even more than I heard those words, I've heard these other ones. You've probably heard them, you've probably said them. Life is not fair, right? It's not fair that my sister got a new dress and I didn't. It's not fair that she gets to go out with her friends and I don't. It's not fair that I'm the one getting in trouble when she started it, right? 
Get over it, little Cindy, my mother would say. Life is not fair. I didn't really grasp the true meaning of the word fair, I think, as a child. But even now that I think I do, the lesson is still a tough one, right? Maybe even tougher as an adult. And as much as I still don't like to hear it, I'm grateful that my mom is still around to remind me that life is not fair. Today, though, it's more like commiserating the two of us about health concerns, our own and those we love, not fair. The effects of the pandemic on our lives, not fair. About the suffering of those who have gotten the virus and those who have loved them, not even remotely fair. About the political climate in our own nation, the cries of so many grieving and crying out for justice, unfair is a gross understatement. Just a few months ago, I shared with you that the section of the book that Kaya read for us from Jonah was part of the inspiration of my own son Jonah's name. Was the prophet was right. There was nothing fair about God's quick forgiveness of the Ninevites who were powerful, powerful enemies of Israel. There was nothing fair about the journey that Jonah had to take to get there. Was it even fair that he was called to that task at all? And though he couldn't see it, that was exactly the point, right? He's angry and says to God, that's why I fled to Tarshish in the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and ready to relent from punishing. He knew it all along. He didn't like it because it wasn't fair. And that, of course, is what I want my own Jonah and his brothers and all of you to know. That ours is a God of love who wants to live in loving relationship with us and with the whole world, whether we like it or not, whether we think we deserve it or not, whether we think those people deserve it, whoever they are. God's mercy is not earned but given. God's grace is not for the few but for the many. God's love is boundless and bold and power enough powerful enough even to conquer death. Years ago, Glennon Doyle, who's now a popular author and speaker, began a blog about life and motherhood called Momastery. <clears throat> and one of those blog posts that I've held down for years and years now was about the importance of putting on her, her spectacles. When I'm wearing my Jesus glasses, she wrote, I see other people how Jesus sees them. Through my Jesus glasses, it becomes crystal clear that every person is my equal, and so confidence and humility come easily. Through my Jesus glasses, I see laid out in front of me ridiculous abundance. Through my Jesus glasses, I see that there is enough, that I am enough, and so is everyone else. When I don't feel these things, I try to catch myself and find my glasses. Call these Jesus glasses, perspectacles. Perhaps that's what the all-day vineyard workers in Jesus' parable needed. Because it's not that their frustration, their grumbling isn't understandable, right? These were day laborers, not like many in our own day. People who were desperate for work to provide for their families. When they were hired in the morning, they were no doubt grateful, knowing that they would have just enough for one more day. But now the day is over, and they've worked 10 or 12 long hours bearing the heat of the day. They're worn out. And you can just imagine their excitement when they saw those who worked only an hour receiving a whole day's wage. They're doing the math in their heads. How much might they receive? What a blessing that would be for their families. We can also imagine their astonishment, their disappointment, their anger when they receive the same one day's wage. Life 
is not fair. And they grumble. Their gratitude turns to resentment. So the owner of the vineyard tries to help them put on their perspectacles. Are you envious because I am generous? The Greek idiom here is translated literally, is your eye evil because I am good? Is your eye evil? It has everything to do with how they see themselves and others and the world around them for all kinds of reasons, hunger, desperation, exhaustion, selfishness, sinfulness, among others. They're unable to see their fellow workers and the landowner and even themselves with the generous, gracious eyes of God. And oh, what they are missing. But what if they could or would put on those Jesus glasses? What if they could see with the eyes of God even for a moment? Perhaps then they would have remembered days when they waited around all day for work and none came. How they had gone, had to go home to their families empty-handed and ashamed. Perhaps they could have seen the one-hour workers as brothers and shared in their joy. Perhaps all could have home, gone home grateful for the blessings they had received. What if we could live our own lives with just a little more gratefulness? With eyes that see ourselves and others both as children of God. Last Monday was Holy Cross Day, and in the devotions that I've been sharing on Facebook each day, we read again about the powerful, gracious way that God sees the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is a God who values love and knows it can't be earned and gives it away freely anyway. Writing about today's parable, another of my favorite bloggers, David Loos, writes, the primary actor in this story is the vineyard owner, the one who keeps sending for workers until everyone has secured employment. The one who instructs the manager to pay generously. The one who takes time to answer the indignant laborers. The one who, in all ways, and at every possible turn, chooses love. It's love that saves. And so when forced to choose between exercising God's just, fair, judgment against us, or forgiving and accepting us in God in Jesus and his cross and resurrection chooses love. No matter how much we identify with those who worked all day, in the end we realize that we too are like the latecomers, those who had no good reason to expect such lavish, even reckless generosity. This is the God we discover in Jesus, the God who looks at us in love and therefore overlooks all those places we fall short and chooses to treat us with unmerited grace, mercy, and generosity. Beloved of God, it is way past time for us to put on our perspective. And imagine how our lives, our community, our nation might change if we could live our lives with just a little bit more gratefulness. With eyes that see ourselves and others, all others, as children of God. How might we see ourselves differently? Our, our families and, and friends, our co-workers, and, and even other fellow Christians. How might we see strangers and others who look or act or think or vote or live differently from us? Might we be better able to extend the generosity of our loving God to one another? Might we be better able to hear the cries, to, to listen to the stories of our black and brown neighbors? 
Might we be more willing to value the lives of our vulnerable neighbors more than our personal rights during a pandemic? Might we be more willing to give and to forgive, to love and to sacrifice for the sake of God's children? I'm not suggesting this is in any way easy. Life is not fair, right? Jonah, Jesus, our own lives make that glaringly clear. But I do know from my own experience that as we live in gratefulness, we more clearly experience the grace of God in our lives. And I am confident that as we do, more of God's children may just experience the love of our gracious God too. Amen. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Generous God, you make the first last and the last first. Where this gospel challenges the church, equip it in its works of service. Strengthen those who suffer for Christ, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Sun and wind, bushes and worms, cattle and great cities. Nothing in creation is outside your concern. Mighty Lord, in your mercy, tend to it all. Give us a spirit of generosity toward all you have made. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Where we find envy and create enemies, you provide enough for all. Bring peace to places of conflict and violence. Inspire leaders with creativity and wisdom. Bless the work of negotiators, peacekeepers, 
and development workers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Even beyond our expectations, you choose to give generously. Grant life, health, and courage to all who are in need. We especially lift up those in need of healing, Mary and David, and those that you know, Lord, need your presence. Be with Bob and Mildred and all who wait. Lord, strengthen the caregivers and the first responders and all who put themselves at risk on a daily basis to care for those in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We praise you for the generations that you have declared your power to us. Give us faithfulness to follow them, living for Christ, until you call us to join them in the joyful song around his throne. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy, to Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Share with one another near you a sign of his peace. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy, mighty, and merciful God, we give you thanks and praise for heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of of me. Remembering therefore his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We invite you now to partake of communion. May the body of Christ and the blood of Christ fill you with goodness and love. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have fed us once again with food beyond compare. The body and blood of Christ lead us from this place, nourished and forgiven, into your beloved vineyard to wipe away the tears of all who hunger and thirst, guided by the example of the same Jesus Christ, and led of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Mother in God, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen. We complete our worship today with the singing of We Are Marching in the Light of God, a song that comes to us from Africa. So we're going to try our best, best Keswahili, to sing this word. So repeat after me. We're going to try it in, in, in African first. Ready? Say Ahamba. Say Ahamba. Say Ahamba Kukanyen. Say Ahamba Kukanyen. Say Ahamba Kukanyen Kwen Kos. Say Ahamba Kukanyen Kwen Kos. That is, we are marching in the light of God. It goes like this. Can I have the first chord? We say Ahamba Kukanyen Kwen Kos. Say Ahamba Kukanyen Kwen Kos. Say a humbuckan yen quen cos. Say a humbuckan yen quen cos. Pick it up. Say a humbuck, some a humbuck. Say a humbuckan yen quen cos. Say a humbuck, say a humbuck. Say a humbuckan yen quen cos. Here we go. We are marching in the See you next week.